Hello and welcome to the Chicago Kent Intellectual Property Law Program webinar. I'm Nicole Vilches, Assistant Dean for Admissions, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. I'm joined by Professor Edward Lee, Director of the Program in Intellectual Property Law, as well as Allison Haas and Franson Brown, who are both current students in the program. In a few moments, Professor Lee will provide an overview of Chicago Kent's IP program, and the students will share their experiences in the program. After that, we'll use any remaining time for your questions. So with that, I will turn things over to Professor Lee and the students for introductions. Thank you, Nicole, and hello everybody out there uh, to all the admitted and prospective students. Thank you for your interest in the Intellectual Property Program at Chicago Kent. We're gonna give you an overview of the program. Uh, I'm Ed Lee, as Nicole said, the director of our IP program. I teach copyright, international IP, and also uh, design law. And I will let our two students introduce themselves. Uh, Frankie, you can start. I'm Francine, or Frankie, either one. Um, I'm a 3L at Chicago Kent. Uh, this May I'll be graduating and getting the IP certificate, uh, which Professor Lee will go into further. And I'm um, interested in copyrights and trademarks here at Kent. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, my background's in computer engineering, so I'm a 2L at Kent. Um, I'm also participating in the IP certificate program and a whole slew of other things that I think we're going to hit along the way. Okay, and also I'll remind you, you'll, you can feel free to type in questions and we'll save time for at least a few questions at the end of the presentation. So now we're going to start the presentation. OK, great. So uh, one of the things about our program, I, I'm guessing that you may have heard about our intellectual property program, which is why you're interested in learning more about it. Uh, we're very pleased that this past year, we were ranked the number one program in the United States by Law Street Media. And uh, you can Google. Uh, Law Street Media, Chicago Kent, to uh, find this article, which nicely, I think, summarizes uh, many of the strengths of our program. I will be go going over a few of them, uh, but uh, we'll be sending you more information for those prospective students about our program as well. Now, one of the strengths of our IP program is uh, our IP faculty. I am just one of eight full-time faculty members who teach intellectual property courses or courses that are related to intellectual property, such as entertainment law or genetics in the law. Uh, very few law schools in the United States devote that many faculty to teach uh, intellectual property courses, but it shows you the significance or importance that Chicago Kent places on intellectual property and uh, offering a robust and diverse set of courses. Uh, in addition to our full-time faculty members, we also have uh, adjunct professors who teach as a part of our program. Uh, many of them are practicing attorneys based here in Chicago. Uh, some of them are alumni of the school, but we also have attorneys from uh, other parts of the United States and even other countries. Uh, just one example to, to give you is that every year, uh, the professor who teaches our very popular software patent course, I don't know if Allison may have taken that course, is uh, Eric Sutton from Oracle. He's an attorney in-house at Oracle in Silicon Valley, and each summer he comes here to teach the course. I have not taken it yet. I'm going to be. Yeah, something to look list. forward to, exactly. Yes. Uh, and we have professors from other countries as well. Uh, it shows some of the strengths that Chicago Kent has in international intellectual property, uh, which is a significant part of our uh, IP program as well. Now, to give you a really broad overview of the IP curriculum and the courses that we offer, uh, this past year we are offering uh, approximately 40 courses that are in intellectual property or related to intellectual property. Of those courses, here is a rough breakdown of the types of courses. Uh, doctrinal courses are what you would consider to be uh, substantive law courses, such as patent law, copyright law, or trademark law. This is the more traditional style of law school course, 
and we offer uh, the greatest number of courses as the doctrinal courses, uh, 16. Uh, then uh, we also offer uh, a half a dozen seminars which are focused on writing a research paper on an IP topic. Uh, there is a seminar requirement to graduate from this law school, so you'll, you'll uh, be required to write a paper uh, to graduate. Uh, we offer also uh, 10 courses that are categorized as skills training courses, which have become increasingly important in law schools and certainly here at Chicago Kent. So these are courses, for instance, our IP clinic, uh, which is run by KNL Gates, a law firm in Chicago, uh, our IP externships, uh, where students go out to uh, several different law firms in Chicago to practice with attorneys in their IP departments. Uh, in addition, courses that are taught at our law school uh, such as patent litigation, where you learn how to draft a motion uh, and an opposition to a motion uh, to get hands-on sort of practice experience. So we offer a, a pretty uh, diverse set of courses in skills training. And then finally, we offer uh, as a part of a different program, not for uh, as categorizing our JD program, the program that I think most of you are considering, we have a master's in IP management and markets, which is a one-year program for primarily uh, people in business who want to learn more about how to manage IP portfolios. But uh, a number of those courses are available to JD students to take as well. Uh, very few law schools in the United States offer this many IP courses to JD students. Uh, so I think that's one of the strengths uh, of our IP program, just the depth of our curriculum. Okay, now Frankie and Allison both mentioned that they are IP certificate students. If you come to Chicago Kent, you can obtain a certificate in the studies of intellectual property. Uh, I won't go through all of the requirements. Here's a rough breakdown of the number of credits you need to get to graduate. It's a pretty doable uh, set of requirements, 20 total. Uh, and notice there is this practice uh, component of five credits, which signals sort of like the importance that we place on practice experience at Chicago Kent. Uh, one reason why students uh, get the certificate is to distinguish their studies uh, to prospective employers that it shows their seriousness in the study of intellectual property. And maybe I'll let either Frankie or Allison uh, talk about briefly their experience in the IP certificate program. One of you want to? Sure. Uh, so my experience in that IP certificate program um, was really great because the three doctrinal classes, copyrights, trademarks, and patents are a requirement. Um, typically, I wouldn't have taken you know, a, a patent-related class, but after taking it, I'm so happy that I did, and the certificate program um, is what led me to do that. Uh, and then the other really great part about it was the practice experience. Um, I was able to obtain an IP externship where I learned um, so many skills, you know, applying what I learned in school to work. So through this certificate program, I think I was able to engage in more opportunities that I otherwise might have ignored or not uh, been open to before. Okay. Uh Moving along, an, another uh, distinguishing feature of Chicago Kent's IP program is something that's a part of the general cur curriculum. It's called 1L Your Way. And uh, I'm guessing some of you may have heard about this already through Nicole's office. 1L Your Way is an innovation that Chicago Kent adopted, I think, four years ago that has expanded the first year curriculum, uh, the curriculum offered to first years to allow first years to take an upper uh, year elective course, meaning courses that are typically available to second and third years. Uh, in the second semester, we allow all first years to take uh, one upper level course of their choosing, and there's always one IP, at least one IP course offered in the second semester to first years. Uh, this year, we've actually expanded it 
so that uh, for students who want to get a head start, so to speak, uh, there is a summer early summer start program for all first year students who can take uh, one course, and typically it's the criminal law course offered. And for students who take that summer course, uh, they are eligible to start taking an IP course in the first semester. And I'm pretty sure that no law school, no other law school in the country offers that kind of opportunity to take uh, IP basically once you start in the fall. Now, uh, so here is a diagram of how that would look if you take the early start criminal law course in the summer, you could take a patent or copyright law course in the first semester and potentially trademark or another IP elective in the second semester. For those of you who are, have science backgrounds and science majors uh, who probably are interested in exploring the possibility of pursuing a career in patent law, uh, one advantage of this 1L Your Way program is that if you do take patent law in the first semester, you are in a position to prepare for the patent bar uh, and potentially pass the patent bar even in your first year. Uh, and that would enable you, by the time the summer comes around, to start working on uh, patent applications because you have a bar registration with the patent office. Uh, so that's one, I think, advantage to undertaking the 1L Yorui program, especially for those of you who are interested in practicing uh, patent law. Now, in addition to the courses that we've just discussed, uh, Chicago Kent offers a variety of other experiences that will enhance your education. Uh, just to continue on discussing the patent uh, offerings of our law school, we are one of approximately 20 so-called patent hubs around the nation who, in conjunction with the United States Patent Office, uh, are offering sort of matchmaking services to help low-income inventors, inventors who don't have that much money to hire an attorney, to find an attorney who can work pro bono to help them file a patent application in the patent office. Uh, this program started at Chicago Kent uh, two years ago. We're the hub for Illinois. Uh, we've already had, I think, three or four patents granted by the patent office. So it's really an exciting program. What's great for students is that students can help the attorneys uh, interview the clients, uh, draft uh, the application, uh, work on uh, actions before the patent office. And I believe Allison has been a part of the patent hub, so she can talk a little bit about her experience. I did, yes. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the Patent Hub uh, last year, actually, as a 1L. Um, and I was paired with an attorney who was working on an application with an, a low-income inventor. And originally, I was only brought in to do the software flow diagrams. But I was working with the attorney, and he had me dive into some more of the application. And it really gave me a great opportunity to kind of make sure that patent law was still interesting to me, uh, so that practical experience. Uh, and also, it was an amazing thing to talk about interviews. And we also think it's just a win-win situation you know, for our students, but also for the low-income uh, inventors. Some of the inventors are students at different schools, uh, engineering schools, uh, Northwestern, medical school, uh, who have interesting ideas and want to pursue an invention and potentially patent it. Uh, so it, it's helping uh, people who otherwise would not be able to get uh, a patent or afford uh, hiring a patent attorney. Okay, moving on to a slightly different topic. In addition to the uh, courses and the patent hub, uh, we have a pretty robust uh, set of uh, conferences that we offer at Chicago Kent. Uh, some are annual conferences and some are, are just uh, one-time conferences. Uh, I will touch upon a few. Uh, one of the main conferences that we offer each year is a Supreme Court IP review. Uh, we've had it for eight years uh, and it's really nationally known in Supreme Court practitioners 
Uh, so for instance, Seth Waxman, gave, he was the former Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, he's argued, I think, nearly 90 cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, he heard about our conference even before we invited him, and he was you know, happy to try to make it work on a schedule. Uh, we were so happy he was able to give the keynote lecture of this past year. Uh, another fun part of this year's conference was that we had uh, the ban that prevailed in the Supreme Court on a First Amendment challenge to the trademark law. Uh, Simon Tam and his band performed in addition to speaking at our conference. Uh, in addition to this conference, we host uh, book talks from uh, authors who published recent uh, books about intellectual property. Uh, we're excited to have in March uh, Professor Orly LaBelle talk about her fascinating book called You Don't Own Me, which talks about the dispute between uh, the Bratz dolls and the Barbie dolls. Uh, Bar the manufacturer of Barbie dolls sued the, the Bratz doll manufacturers, and this litigation was uh, ongoing. And her book has received uh, great reviews, and we're really excited to have her. Now, in addition to the conferences, we also have two main IP centers. And uh, I think somewhat coincidentally, uh, this next center that I'm going to talk about, uh, we're launching actually today in a couple hours, which is one of the reasons why I'm dressed up. So it's a very exciting day uh, for me to be a part of this launch. Uh, so the Center for Design, Law, and Technology is the first of its kind in the United States, uh, investigating, doing research on issues related to design, uh, design protection and technology. Uh, and uh, the protection of design has in the past decade become uh, really, we've seen the most design patent applications, most uh, design rights granted in the EU. There's a real uh, interest and demand among businesses for design. Uh, so uh, Chicago Kent figured that this is one area that needs to be studied more uh, and we're really excited about this launch that's coming up uh, tonight. The other center that we have is the Center for Empirical Studies of IP, which uh, takes a quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis and research of intellectual property issues. Uh, we've hosted a number of different conferences uh, in conjunction with the Patent Office, in conjunction with the Copyright Office, and in this past year, in conjunction with the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, which is a part of the Patent Office. Uh, and this is a real, this, this also uh, was one of the, Chicago Kent was the first in the country to devote a center uh, on empirical studies of IP. So we're really proud of this uh, center. Okay, now moving along to uh, talk briefly about some of the amazing extracurricular activities that students can engage in. Uh, we're going to talk about the moot court competition first, uh, and we're lucky to have uh, one of the participants, uh, Frankie, in the moot court competition. Our moot court teams have done tremendously well in the moot court competitions. Uh, this year, our team just uh, placed second in the Midwest Regional and also earned the best brief for the entire Midwest region. We'll be going to nationals, I believe, later in March. Uh, last year, Frankie was a part of the winning team in the Midwest Regional, and I will let Frankie talk about that experience a little bit. Uh, the experience with uh, the Lefkowitz moot court specifically was kind of eye-opening. Um, we were able to not only you know, draft a brief and argue to judges, but we were able to communicate and network with the judges after the actual um, arguments. Um, we made a ton of connections in Chicago and then because we got first place in the Midwest, we were able to go to Washington DC and argue with the federal circuit, which happens to be right next to the White House. And it was a really unique experience for a, a law student to be able to argue in, in courts that you know, esteemed uh, attorneys argue in um, we worked one-on-one -on -one with Ashley Boucher, who is the coach, and she's amazing. Uh, she gave us tips that I will be using for the rest of my life, and I uh, built connections through this that I will be using for the entirety of my legal career. And Professor Boucher is, uh, also teaches in our program as well, and she'll, she teaches, obviously, trademark law, uh, and she's a fantastic coach. 
uh, her team three years ago actually placed second in the nation uh, of all the law schools that were in the competition. Uh, and in the Saul Lifkowitz competition, I believe, is is the oldest uh, IP moot court competition. So it, it shows you uh, what an accomplishment it is. We're tremendously proud of our moot court uh, teams and, and our students involved in the, in the teams. Uh, another extracurricular that many of our students who are interested in intellectual property join is the Intellectual Property Law Society. It's one of our largest student organizations boasting over 200 students. Uh, typically, this, the IPLS group hosts two conferences of their own. Uh, so, for instance, uh, last year they hosted a conference on trademark and marijuana products. Uh, and the IPLS, you know, typically picks topics that are kind, uh, very cutting edge, very timely and hot topics. And it adds to the depth of our IP program. Uh, these are completely separate from the, the conferences that uh, the, my department, the IP program, runs. So it just shows you that there's a lot of uh, IP uh, conferences and offerings for you to choose from. One other thing I'll mention quickly that's noted on this slide is that the IPLS also is heavily involved in mentorship. Uh, there is a mentoring program where they pair students with practicing attorneys in Chicago. Uh, many of them are alums of the school who love to pay back and give to our school and our students. Uh, I don't know if one of you want to talk about the mentoring program. Um, well, first off, I'd like to point out that we also have um, a new program this year uh, where it's uh, like a big little program where we connect first year students with upperclassmen. So where the assigned alumni mentor program, you can ask questions about furthering your career, uh, get, getting that type of advice. Uh, in the big little program, you can talk to an upperclassman about uh, more class related, like what teacher should I take? How do I prepare for finals? Uh, that kind of thing. And I, I think that everyone's really enjoyed both of those. Terrific. Okay. One other uh, extracurricular that many intellectual property students uh, join is our Journal of Intellectual Property. Uh, this journal uh, publishes a symposium related to the Supreme Court conference uh, I mentioned. Uh, another interesting uh, development is in the past year, uh, this journal has become the official publication uh, for the Patent Trial and Appeal Board Bar, the PTAP Bar, which is a national bar boasting, I think, a couple thousand members. So it's a great way to network with uh, people who are practicing in the area of patents. Uh, in addition to those uh, symposia, the journal publishes uh, sort of standard submissions from uh, attorneys and law professors around the country. Uh, Allison's also on the journal and you want to speak a little bit about your experience? I am. I'm an associate editor with the journal, and it's it's really been a great experience. It's been, um, well, first off, a great way to get to see these articles right when they're released, uh, before they've been published, and you can kind of get that insight into the um, these developments within the law, um, and also to hone your technical skills. Okay, so that's the uh, overview of our IP program. Uh, if any of you have further questions that are not answered in the Q&A session that's coming up, feel free to uh, email me at the email address above. Uh, you also can email the students through Nicole's office, uh, and she will get your question to the, to the students if you have a specific question for the students. Okay, so now I think we're going to turn to a few questions that some of you have submitted. And sorry if we're not able to answer all of your questions. Uh, in the remaining time that we have. Yes, if you do have any questions for the panel, um, please use the questions box in the webinar software and we would be happy to answer those questions for you. And I guess maybe while we wait for our first question to come in, um, do you want to maybe talk a little bit more, uh, any more comments on your experience as students in the program? Any particular things that have really stood out for you as highlights? Well, we've got our first question, so we'll leave mine for later. Um, so the first one is, would there be any challenges for an evening student who wants to pursue the IP certificate? Not, not really. So uh, in scheduling courses, uh, 
the dean who's in charge of scheduling courses make sure that uh, it is feasible for an evening student to obtain the IP certificate. Uh, so just for an example, for all of the core courses that are required, patent, copyright, and trademark, there is an evening uh, uh, version of that course offered uh, every year. Uh, so uh, we've had plenty of evening students who have obtained the IP certificate, so I don't think there should be a problem with that. Okay, next question. Are there any prerequisites in order to study IP law? Not, not really. So for IP law, the only prerequisite would come in if you want to file patent applications with the patent office, what's called prosecuting patents. In order to do that, you would need to pass the patent bar and the patent office has uh, requirements about what major uh, prior education you've had, typically in a science uh, related uh, study, area of study. Uh, other than that area, there is no prerequisite in practicing, even in, for instance, patent litigation. I, I've known students who had no science backgrounds who ended up in patent litigation. Uh, and copyright and trademark uh, certainly do not have any prerequisites either. Our next question is, can you touch on any IP entertainment courses and what's covered in those courses? Okay, great. Yeah, we have a few that are related to entertainment law. Uh, and uh, um, please excuse me if I forget um, all of that. Uh, we, we offer two sections typically or two courses during the entire year of entertainment law itself, which covers um, a variety of different uh, issues uh, related to uh, IP, but also licensing. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the entertainment law course. Maybe you want to see. Okay. I took the entertainment law seminar, um, which we were able to write a paper basically on any topic that we were interested in for in the huge field of entertainment law. And then we also got to hear from the other students in their uh, topics that they had written about. So we were learning about our topic, but also what the other students um, were writing about. So um, it was cool to hear from all different aspects of entertainment law, from sports even. There was some of that in there too, copyrights and music. Okay, and that nicely uh, brings up a couple of other courses that are somewhat related. There are courses specifically on sports law and uh, music law. Uh, and there's actually a video game law, which is, I don't know if you categorize that as entertainment law, entertainment in industry, but a video game law as well. And those courses uh, go into great depth into those respective fields. So next question is, uh, can the IP certificate be obtained without having to take additional credits to the regular JD curriculum? So is, it, is, the, is the program done within the JD curriculum or is it additional credits to receive it? Yes. So it's, it's just within the credits that you can apply towards your JD. And I, as a second year, I'm already really close to finishing uh, all the requirements for the certificate. I already have the, um, I took the IP clinic, so I already have the, um, uh, what's the term? Practical. The practical credits. Yeah, it's very doable to fit within uh, your just taking courses as a second and third year to complete IP certificate in addition, take courses that are related to the bar and whatever interests you as well. So there's a lot of flexibility built in. The uh, next question is, do you suggest trying to pass the patent bar before coming in as a 1L? And does that have any impact on securing a job the first summer? The one thing that I've heard from our, I, we have two different IP boards, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. Uh, all of the board members have advised us to recommend to our students to uh, study for and for those students who are interested in patent law, uh, study and uh, eventually pass the patent bar at a time when it's most convenient to do so. Uh, whether it be it could be before uh, law school if you have that time to study, uh, it could be during law school. Uh, so it, it definitely is an advantage to have 
your patent bar registration number on a resume uh, when you're submitting it to prospective employers who look at it and say, oh, this student is very serious and already has some background in patents and can start even working on an application. And maybe, Allison, do you want to speak to this? Oh, you've thought about the patent bar. I have. Um, I have not yet taken and passed the patent bar, um, even though I am a second year. And I would agree with what Professor Lee said, that it's a nice thing to have on your resume, but I don't think that it's um, it, it would hold you back from getting a job. Um, I'm planning on studying for and taking it this summer. Um, yeah, a lot of it is when students find the time to study for it because it is uh, a lot of memorization, I think. Yes. Uh, so. Great. so we've reached the end of the time for our webinar. I know we did still have a couple of questions that we didn't get to answer, so we will respond to you um, separately uh, by email for those. And if you have any remaining questions, please feel free to contact the Office of Admissions. You can reach us at admissions at kentlaw.iit.edu, and we're happy to answer those questions or put you in touch with Professor Lee or students in the program. So we appreciate you attending the webinar today, and we look forward to speaking with you further. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.